airing first on Asheville FM in Asheville, North Carolina. This is the Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian podcast and broadcast emanating from occupied Saligay land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from the long struggle towards liberation from around the world. Welcome. This week on The Final Straw, we're sharing another audio gift from comrades, an interview with Isabel Diaz Torres, a participant in the Taller Libertario Alfredo Lopez slash Abra in Havana, Cuba, a social center and anarchist bookstore of sorts, recorded in late 2018. In this chat, Isabel talks about Abra, which is the only openly anarchist organization in Cuba at this time, about the LGBTQ movement and abortion rights, which are both facing repression due to pressure on the government by Cuban evangelical and Catholic churches, also about political discourse and difference, government co-optation, neoliberalism, animal rights, repression of dissent, and erasure of anarchist history in Cuba. In May of 2019, Isabel and his boyfriend, Jimmy Roque Martinez, were arrested on their way to the annual Conga Against Homophobia and Transphobia event, essentially Cuba's main gay pride parade, and detained for 24 hours in order to block their participation. The National Center for Sex Education, or CENESEX in Spanish, had bowed to pressure from right-wing Christian groups and canceled the event, so activists were planning to hold an autonomous conga line, which resulted in several more arrests. A report with updates on the subject can be found at Rosa Negra Black Rose Federation website, which we link in the show notes, alongside of an audio statement from Mario of the TLAL space on the subject in Spanish also recorded by Rosa Negra. To learn more about Abra, they have a website at centrosocialabra.wordpress.com as well as a Fedbook page as Abra Cuba. And there's also a Fedbook page for Taller Libertario Alfredo Lopez, which we link in the show notes. Abra is affiliated with the Federación Anarquista de Centro América y el Caribe, or the Caribbean and Central American Anarchist Federation which can be found in Spanish at their website f-anarchista-cc.blogspot.com. You can check our show notes for useful articles and a link to Frank Fernandez's much-talked-about book, Cuban Anarchism, which can be ordered online or be read for free on the Anarchist Library. Another book suggestion is Anarchist Cuba, Countercultural Politics in the Early 20th Century by Kirwin Schaffer. We'd like to say a brief hello to our new listeners on Royalton Community Radio in eastern so-called Vermont, where this show will air every Saturday at 10 p.m. following nocturnal combustion, as well as Tuesday mornings at 5 a.m. Hi! Also, if you'd like to hear two recent interviews with the host of the show, check out last week's FE Live podcast with David Rovix for Fifth Estate Magazine as well as the final episode of the Soulcast from the end of 2020, which is soon to be renamed the Institute for Post-American Studies podcast. As is common, we didn't have time to air the Sean Swain segment for this week, so if you'd care to hear that, check out the podcast edition of this up at our website. The Final Star Radio is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. Kite Line is a weekly 30-minute radio program focusing on issues in the prison system. You'll hear news along with stories from prisoners and former prisoners as well as their loved ones. You'll learn what prison is, how it functions, and how it impacts all of us. Behind the prison walls, a message is called a kite. Whispered words, a note passed hand to hand, a request submitted to the guards for medical care. Illicit or not, sending a kite means trusting that other people will bear it farther along until it reaches its destination. Here on KiteLine, we hope to share these words across the prison walls. You can hear us on the Channel Zero Network and find out more at kitelineradio.noblogs.org. I guess if you could just tell me who you are and what the space is. Okay. Uh, my name is Isabel Diaz Torres, and uh, I'm a member of uh, Taller Libertario Alfredo Lopez, which is, I guess, the only anarchist organization here in Cuba. But it doesn't mean that we are the only anarchist people, right? So, but organized and you know, and you know, public is us, from my knowledge. And uh, we've been working uh, for about almost ten years as an anarchist organization. But before that, we were in other uh, 
uh, anti-capitalist organizations in general, independent ones, right, in Cuba. And but eventually we decided we wanted to form like an anarchist group, and so we made it. And the space, although it is run by us, by the, by the people of the Taller Libertad of Fredo Lopez, is not exactly like an anarchist space only. You know, it's it's open to uh, communitarian activities or I don't I don't know, anything that we like because we feel that it's it's. Uh, coherent with our view of what life is or what development is or what culture is etc so <clears throat> so the space is abra and it's just a word in spanish that has a lot of meanings about seven different meanings over there <laughs> you can see the word abra and it's but eventually but, but it, it is also open in a way it's you know, open open the door Abra la puerta, right? It's something like that. And uh, <clears throat> we started this place uh, almost a year ago. It was in May 2018. And we made a crowdfunding on the internet because first we made like a tour in, we made a tour in, in France and Spain. And then the conference there, they all had different I don't know, libraries or cafes or different like physical spaces where they could gather, we, they could have meetings and they all the time ask us, uh, do you have a place? And we, we didn't have a place. And then the idea started that, okay, why don't we create like a physical space for us to meet? And, and so with that, with the help of all the comrades that we met in, in France and Spain, uh, You feel free to go whatever you want to. <laughs> and so we made a crowdfunding, we got the money, and we bought the house. So now uh, it's uh, still not fully, it's not completely ready yet. We're still working and designing what kind of activities we want to do here. And uh, we don't want to go very fast because we want to be inserted in the community in a more organic way so we don't, we don't want to look like aliens that come here and tell the people what they need to think or what they need to do we just want to be neighbors and we want to propose activities and get to know what they need or what they want and which are pretty much our same needs because we live here so uh, in a sense uh, that's what we're trying to to do with this space The first thing that caught my attention was the big rainbow flag. And also, we went to a subcultural event in Santa Clara, Emihunque. I couldn't tell if it was a gay bar or just had gay nights, but there seemed to be some overlaps there. Is anarchism and counterculture very linked to the LGBTQ movement in Cuba? What's the history of the relationship between them? Oh, well, I, don't, I don't think it's that you could say like anarchism and LGBTQ movements uh, have a link. A link, in a way, it are, you know, uh, some of us who are gay or lesbians are, are queer people, in a way. But, but not because of the, the history of the movements. When you go to the history of the, mov uh, the movement of anarchism in Cuba, it was pretty much uh, anarcho-syndicalism. And I, don't, I, I wouldn't say it has any relation with any gender topics or LGTB topics or anything like that. The only link that I can identify, which is was quite interesting is that uh, some of those Arab syndicalist groups I'm talking in the 50s 40s of, last, of the past century they had this the naturists groups and they go to wild naked that had this kind of interaction and it was very cool and so it has something to do with sex or gender or that kind of stuff in a way but But that's that's very something that I want to say about it. But it's, but it's it's not all right. Like they were really thinking in these terms, like LGTB movement or feminism movement. I think so. Now we are in the thing is my boyfriend and I we are a gay couple, and uh, so we are promoting this uh, topic inside our group. 
some the rest of the groups are some uh, most of them are males heterosexual males so in a way it's like a process of uh, learning how to break all those all paradigms of heterosexism and that kind of, that, that stuff right and but the difference is that we do have access we get we we've been in touch with people with a different perspective about it it's not like what common people a like common lgtv movement in cuba what they receive the information they get is what you can see on the internet right but they don't know about like radical lgtv or um, queer people or you know radical feminism that kind of stuff so we do have a lot of materials of that we want to promote that kind of of uh, ideas in a way so we have when you see in, in our library and the stuff that we publish we have those materials so we promote that kind and so that's something different when you see the whole the LGBTQ expect spectrum you can see like right-wing people leftist there but then us we are more radical about it you know, in, in a way in a sense what is right wing in Cuba? And also, when you talk about anti capitalist groups, what does being anti capitalist mean in Cuba? Does everyone think they live in an anti capitalist country? I guess people are not thinking in those terms anymore. In a way, maybe, but that's, that's what's, that was part of our speech, or of our language 20 years ago. But not anymore. So people, they don't think about it. That's why we use the word anti capitalist. And even for Cuba, it's like, Come on, man, what are you talking about? Nobody cares about it. In fact, if you're going to ask me, I mean, them, they would say that they love capitalism, capitalism in a way, right? Although they don't really accept that, they don't say that in those terms, but they do love consumption, they love international corporations to come and invest in Cuba, they agree with, I don't know, credits or, I don't know, the whole economic structure related to capitalism, right? So they don't have any questions about it. In fact, when they de- made their demands to the to the Cuban government, is pretty much asking for that kind of liberties, like economic liberties. So, so they are in a way, you know, they do like capitalism uh, in many ways. It's very difficult because you have different discourses. In in one hand, you have the speech of the government. And they would say that anyone who opposes opposes them are right wing, in a way, you know, because you know you just need to be loyal to the system, not to the idea of emancipation or anything like that. You have to be loyal to the government and to the leaders in the government. That's their idea of what a leftist person is, of what anti-capitalism is. That in one hand. In the other hand. Other people recognize capitalism as what it is. It's you know where a system of relations where the persons are alienated in a way, in a many different ways. From my perspective, it is about it's everything is there. You know what what kind of social class you are. If you are a worker, you are honor an honor, but also your gender, also your race. Uh, you know the color of the skin, where you're coming from, what part of the island you are, what's your job, how much money do you have? So everything has to do with with with, with you know being anti-capitalist in in my from my perspective, and they don't want to acknowledge that, of course. So for them, if you are well, them for for us, we can identify right wing movements or right-wing persons or collectives here in Cuba, both into the system and independent ones. So you can identify, for example, there is one organization here in Cuba, Her, its name is Estado Sats. It's pretty much like the most prominent right-wing organization here in Cuba. Of course, they are against the government and the government repress them as much as they can and they are like think tanks in a way and they propose designs of the economy that has to do with free markets or private property they want to privatize pretty much everything including the healthcare system 
the educational system. So that's pretty obvious that they are right wing in in that sense. But when you try to find out what's their position regarding other topics, for example, you know, abortion or relationship with you know the, the position of LGTV people in the society or racism, etc. Maybe they have a pretty much progressive position about it. Then you have other sectors in the society that maybe they are not promoting this kind of free market, but they do have a very conservative uh, position, like they are members of a very orthodox uh, Christian churches. They are against uh, gay and equalitarian marriage and Yeah, we are. We've been fighting with them the last months, <laughs> and uh, so that's another part of the society. Maybe they are not organized in a political way, like you know, like challenging the government, but they do have the means and they have you know the the resources to promote this uh, this this kind of ideas, right? So that's another sector. And then inside the government, as a third, you know, I first mentioned the opposition, the right wing opposition. Then I mentioned the shores or all, all the families who are uh, gathered around that. And then at the third place, in my opinion, inside the government, uh, there is a lot of people who are promoting this kind of economic activities that include lifting any. How you how would you say the opposition of protection of protectionism is like okay no taxes or no you know for the for foreign investors to come to Cuba and do what they want or no unions workers uh, union of workers inside those business with international corporations that kind of of design of economic relation is. It what, it what they promote, and in my opinion, they are right wing as well. <laughs> This is the Final Straw Radio, and you're hearing a chat with Isabel Diaz Torres, an anarchist, LGBT, and ecological activist, and participant in a social center in Havana, Cuba, recorded in 2018 by a comrade. And is abortion legal in Cuba? Abortion, yes, but uh, it's although we it's like a struggle that we already won. I am very afraid that that can retroceder, como se diría? Um, regulated in a very strong way, I don't know it's, it's like, it, it, I'm worried because you know, the government is in constant dialogue with Catholic Church and with Protestant churches in fact the ones that really, op well, both of them opposed the gay marriage or the idea of, of the possibility of gay marriage to be included at the, at the Constitution recently. So they m made like very strong statements saying that their people, you know, the people who go to their churches, churches will, would vote no to the new Constitution if they didn't change that that content, you know, regarding the, the equalitarian marriage. And the government, what was it, complied, is it? They, they accepted and they changed it in a way so they do know that they have the strength enough to challenge the government to do what they want to do and then on the other hand those conversations are never public so you really never know what they're talking about they have their meetings but they are not open to press or if there are well, it just really doesn't matter because Cuban press they don't really know <laughs> what happened in, in, in anywhere so so Yes, I'm concerned in that sense. I want to go back to the history of anarchism before the revolution. Well, I'll do my best, but Mario is the one who knows about it. But I can give you some element. Yeah, a broad picture. Well, first I do recommend you, for you to read the, key, the, the book Anarchism in Cuba by Fran Fernandez. Fran Fernandez lives in, in Miami. And the book is, in, is both in Spanish and English. You can download, download it or you can even buy it on Amazon. So this is a good version of, uh, of the history of the of the anarchist movement Cuba before 1959 before the triumph of the revolution and as I mentioned yeah it's, it's it was pretty much like anarch syndicalist uh, movements and there was there was this person this figure who is Alfredo Lopez died over there right? really connected with the liberation movement in Cuba but 
of course, uh, at some point, in my opinion, because of the link of the leaders of Fidel Castro and the rest of the leaders of the 26 de Julio movement with the Partido Socialista Popular, who was the Communist Party here in Cuba, and received direct orders from the USSR Communist Party. After the triumph of the revolution, most of the of anarchists were sent to prison or were killed or were sent to exile. So it it uh, it collapsed. I guess Mario has the, the exact date but the last public meeting that they held took place maybe one year after the triumph of the revolution. That was the last time we heard about it. And we've been without any archive archive movement, movement for decades. Uh, although you, maybe you can find on the internet some references to other groups in Pinal del Rio, Zapata group or something like that. But we really don't have any certainty of if they really existed. It was during the, during the 90s or 80s, 90s, when you look for that on the internet. But we don't have any direct information, so we don't know. As far as we know, we are who took the spirit of anarchism again and tried to do to make a movement with that. But on the other hand, I would say that the anarchist spirit in a way was present in the people of Cuba, in the common sense of Cuban people in a way. So you would see that's part of a work of that Mario do is try to identify like anti-authoritarian structures or people who decided to organize beyond the government and with no relation with the government and for us that's that's a symptom of anarchist feelings because maybe for you it's it really has nothing to do but for Cuba where everything was related to the government for decades with who had no private property Everything, you know, the government, the state checked every th single activity that you can imagine, economic or even your personal relationships, culture, art, everything was controlled by the government. So when you find something that tried to exist outside those barriers, then we consider that, that as a symptom of anarchism spirit in a way. I read the Frank Fernandez book years ago, and it described a narco-syndicalist unions that had tens and hundreds of thousands of members, and I was wondering, where did they go after the revolution? He talks about some of them that were exiled or killed, but tens of thousands of members? But the activity of the Communist Party, because they infiltrated into that, into that uh, organizations and turned that into these vertical unions and communist uh, structures. And so when, when we talk about people who were exiled or were killed, I'm talking about, you know, the heads of movements, but, you know, common workers, they were the vic victims of the Partido Socialista Popular was the name of the previous uh, communist party. And That's a good segue. I understand that the modern Cuban authoritarian state uses a subtle and soft touch in order to exert its influence politically. But what does it look like today? How the state influences how the state influences dissent or alternative political organizing? Well, they do have an impact, and uh, and when you are a member, you feel it. But when you are just a neighbor, then you say, "Oh no, nothing is wrong. Nothing is really happening." But for example, you see this banner, this poster here. Okay, that poster was just there, facing the street, and then we receive an inspection, a non-political one, right? It say, okay, you don't, you, you have no license to put that banner over there, so you have ticket two two hundred pesos, and you have two days to remove the sign from there, and they inspect the whole house. Because they say that they received an anonymous complaint that we were illegally constructing in here, you know, building walls, or which was of course a lie. This is just an excuse to get into the house, inspect the whole house, and then they did that. You see? Or for example, the most common thing that they do is since all of the structure of of, this, of employment has changed in the last years. 
but maybe 10, 15 years ago, and we've been working for almost 20 years now, all the employees were state employees, all of them. So if you receive a visit at your work of, uh, place of work, and the, you know this uh, political police talk to your boss and say, okay, this guy is, is having meeting, meetings with uh, counter-revolutionary people, then you could you could be fired. In fact, my boyfriend has been has been fired twice, and he's an optometrist. Uh, so that kind of pressure is over us, but that's for us who are ha we have like a public face and we are we consider ourselves as anti-capitalist and we have friends and comrades of different movements all around the world but when you go to small uh, organizations well we are small <laughs> we're very small but i mean it's an organization that just started that has no history in a way right it's very easy for them to dismantle that because it's just that just with with just one phone call they will stop everything so yeah it's very real and and it's not what they do only it's also the history that's still on the imagination of people in a way right so it it triggers something there that tells okay i cannot say this in this public place because it can be repressed in a way and then we say oh but there is no repression i don't see repression but people repress themselves you know, they don't express themselves freely and and it really works so we don't need when you make a comparison you said there is no repression in cuba but because we didn't we never saw policemen like beating people on the streets of, with water or with gas or anything like that but what i think that we are so much worse that they don't even need that the control is so well installed in the in in, in the brain of, of people in the common sense of people of the communities that they don't need that kind of stuff that's the reason why people in the neighborhood very few of them have has come inside this house most of them want to know what's happening but they don't are brave enough just to come up here and see what's inside mm. you see? so oh, for example we need to be very careful with everything that we do because they can use anything against us anytime for example when we started this space we painted i don't know if you saw you you saw the, the door was painted and the, this wall here is also painted and we made that by ourselves but also you know the kids of the of the neighborhood you see do you listen to those kids out there when they already came this morning asking me okay we want to draw we want to grow plants want to do something we are worried worried we have nothing nothing to do and so we're all the time like proposing stuff for them to do and they were involved in painting all these walls and the next day a security of state officer came to us and said i know who you are i know what you're trying and why we won't allow you to do that with the kids of the neighborhood is it why no but you were taking pictures of the kids well we were taking pictures of the whole process because that's part of our history and we want to have you know a record of that no but you were taking pictures of black kids who were poor that's what she said the officer and she just she lives just there and they say okay that's what they are right if you want to change that okay i don't know how you're going to say to change the, the color of the skin but po uh, poverty that's something you could do something about <laughs> uh, and what we did is the next day we printed all the pictures and we go to the to those kids families and we give them the pictures as a, as a gift and everybody loved it because you know they cannot afford to print to have photo of their kids so we with our money we printed photos we take it to the parents and they were okay yeah. and then I, we informed them them okay your kid your, your son your daughter was yesterday with us painting 
uh, and we took a picture. This is the pictures that okay. Everybody liked it. Everybody loved it. It was super cool, and we had no problem with it with the community, with the parents, or anything like that. But that's something. That's a measure that we need to uh, to take in order to not to face any possible demand in the future that we were manipulating using the image of children or something like that. Uh, so it's very it's it's every day is every time there's so you need to watch every single step that you made to in order not to make a mistake so that's how, in a way how it expressed the repression but there are so many other ways for example they can stop you from leaving the country a lot of people have been stopped at the airport with no reason they just stop them the airplane is right there they wait until the plane goes and they release the, the person. And so do you know what it means for a Cuban to, to miss a, a, a flight? It's a lot of money. He needed to pay for the passport, he needed to pay for the visa, for to legalize all the documents, to buy the ticket, and then he can lose all the money, all that money just because the security stopped them at the airport for no reason. And then yeah. Or when, or when you come back, for example, the first time I visited the U.S., I was stopped at the airport, and they took you know the Frank Fernandez book. Mm -hmm. I had one copy, hand signed by by Frank Fernandez, and they take it away. They took it away. They took all my laptop, all the hard drives, all the pen drives, all the materials, all the books, all the newspapers. And 10 days after, they returned everything to me, except from Fernandez's book and a newspaper. But they checked all my information, my telephone, they, they kept everything, right? So it's a... Uh, yeah, that's the way that they control, and it works. Um, for people like us, that we are like a little bit training in this kind of fight, we can deal with that. We can we can handle that. But for John student, or John univers some university student that suffers that for the first for the first time, he will never come to this place anymore. That's why it's so difficult for us to grow in membership because it's uh, they 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 do work. For example, with the environmentalist group, Guardabosques is another group that is connected with this movement here. They have approached to young people and said that we are members, and we, are, we receive money from the CIA, from the US CIA. And they would believe that. Why would not? I mean, that's the information that they receive all the time on the, on the television in Cuba. Why not? And then, five years later, they come to me and say, okay, you know why they never came again to your spaces? Because we received a visit, visit from an officer saying that you were. Uh, receiving money from the CIA. That's super difficult. <laughs>
And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. Killed by Police 2020, a list compiled by killedbypolice.net. Derek A. Elseth, Teddy James Maverick Varner, Gerardo Antonio Conchas Bostas, Gabriel Strickland, Jeffrey Dale Millsap, Stanley Hayes, Jamari Dewan Tarver, Troy Sollinger, Mariano O'Conn, Michael Gregory, Tyree Davis, George Dyson, Kwame Jones, Brandon D. Roberts, Drew Nicholas Wallace Flores, Micaiah Lee, Samuel Lanham, Troy Chase Castor, Xavier Jaime Rove, Orlando Abieta, Nico Descini, Dallas Pierce, Daniel Dwayne Jensen, Dustin M. Eaton, Madison James, Earl Facey, Cody Carnes, Joshua Franklin Roberts, Claude Fain, Bernie Wade Johnson, Juan Ayan Ruiz, Clando Antinoch, Eric Reynolds, Henry Isaac Jones, Ryan O'Sims, Victor Valencia, Brad Steerwalt, Thomas Charles Snyder, Keenan McCain, Randy Glenn Goodale, Eliza Perez, Renard Antonio Daniels, Frank Kogar, Landwell Vance McCall, Aaron Phillips, Albert Lee Hughes, Jack Bullinger, Owen Barton, Mubarak Suleiman, Samuel David Mallard, Dustin Alexander Nieles, Edward Gendron, Miguel Mercado Segura, Jonathan David Messere, Dustin Fur, Anthony Langley, Reginald Leon Boston, Rory Bailing, Darius J. Tarver, Sok Chin Son, John Philip Bryant, Armando Moreno Garcia, Adam Ray Hernandez, Deandra Lacey Burrow Patterson, James Lewis Mathis, Gage Scott Sothard, Marcus Golden, Andrew Simira, Michael Rivera, Scott Joseph Weber, Toby Diller, Rebecca Angel Alexander, Deovian Samej Perkins, Joshua James Brown, Kevin Allen Smallman, William Howard Green, Aaron T. Booker, John Francis Tippett, Joshua Greenleaf, Robert Cosio, Jonathan Bentley, Jaquin O'Neill Light, Clint Stevens, Justin Lehman, Chad Nicolia, Abdiraman Salad, Keith Dutry Collins, Richard Davis, February, Leonard Parker, Vincent Conti, Ronel Mazon, Alvin Cole, Jason Gora, Chris Cadot, Mark Dominic Neal, Darius Tarver, Sean Michael Taylor, Dominique Antoine Anderson, Thomas Barbosa, Daniel Murillo, Gaston A. Navasicito, Sean Patrick Constance, Justin Root, Michael Collins, Joshua Downing, Douglas Harold Hart, Timothy DeBella, Gordon Whittaker, Eric Robinson, Zane Blaisdell, Jeremy Grayson, Michael Leatherwood, Bobby Gibbs, Jeremy Todd Baham, Thomas Ray Chambly, Hans Alejandro Huitz, Michael Murillo, Dakota Lee Charlson, Jeremy Fox, Brian Francis Fillion, Aaron Marcos Valdez, 
Abel Lopez Lopez, William Bluestone, David Kent Heek, Christopher Gutierrez, Timothy Leroy Harrington, Daylene Pulo, Thomas Murray, Kerry Michael Bonsom, Rudy Arenas, Brandon Lewis, Travis Mullins, Jeremy Dewey, Kevin Aldolfe, Alexander Francisco Vasquez, Joseph Jewell, John Daniel Dixon, John James Monahan, Manuel Arabello, an unidentified person, male, an unidentified person, female, Rodrigo Ivan Aguirre, Boyce Melvin Thayer, Lucas Alvarado, Print Zuntavern, Stephen O'Brien, Kenneth Sashington, San Juan Miguel Thomas, Matthew Felix, Neil Stewart Nevada, Dylan Omeda, an unidentified person, male, Terry Hasty, David William Irving, Justin Lee Stackhouse, Ramiro Carrasco, James Thompson, William Resto, an unidentified person, male, Kent Richard Kruger, Joshua David Hernandez Lord, Dorgel Cicerno Mesa, Jose L. Rivera, Anthony Taylor, Richard Rodriguez, Stephen Doris. You can write to Sean Swain at his latest address at Sean Swain number 2015638, Buckingham Correctional, P.O. Box 430, Dillwyn, Virginia 23936. You can find his past writings, recordings of his audio segments, and updates on his case at seanswain.org, or now follow him on Twitter at, at Swain Rocks. This is the Final Straw Radio, and you're hearing a chat with Isabel Diaz Torres, an anarchist, LGBT, and ecological activist and participant in a social center in Havana, Cuba, recorded in 2018 by a comrade. How do people in Cuba become anarchists? How do they hear about it? How do they learn besides the CIA paying them? I don't know. <laughs> I, I believe people that just, just don't become anarchists. Is there anything about anarchist movement in university history classes or anything? No way. One of the members of, the, of, of our collective... Uh, he is a student at the History and Philosophy Faculty at the Havana University. And we just yesterday we were talking about that. Because they were starting a political movements discourse and I asked him if they if anarchism was there somewhere. He said, no. My professors they don't even know what's that. They don't know what anarchism is. The professors. Camilo Cienfuegos' parents were anarchists, I think. What? Cienfuegos' parents were in the CNT in Spain during the revolution there. In Spain, yeah. But it's not in history. Cuban, you know, Cuban students, they don't, they don't know that. that Did Che and Fidel kill Camilo Cienfuegos? How can I tell? But it's, a, you know, but, you know, Camilo is a very... We really love Camilo in a way. I guess because... He didn't have the chance to become into a... <laughs> one of the others. Like, like Rosa Luxemburg? Exactly. But he was very, you know, like a very plain person. If, you know, people from the streets get, could, have very, could have access to him. Because they were, he was not like intellectual or any... He was not thinking in terms of ideology, I guess. But he was, he was just a fighter who fought for freedom or liberties or justice, whatever. Uh, so in, in that sense, I'm not saying that Camilo Sofé was an anarchist, but but he was a very, you know, was a figure very close to the Cuban people. And that's why we used his image in one of our, let me show you, I, that's a vacuuming, it has nothing to do with Camilo, but anyway, uh, so we had those bookmarks in that's that's the symbol of uh, Observatorio Critico. So we play with that, and we are in the neighborhood where Camilo Cienfuegos was born. Oh really? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. La Avenida Cienfuegos is right there. But nobody says Avenida Cienfuegos. Okay? Dolores Avenida, and his house was there, and there was a, a plaque on the wall, and it was stolen maybe six months ago. And nobody cares. It's just, it's just there. Nothing happened. The government didn't just put it on a plane and... I don't know. <laughs> 
<laughs> what else? What kind of issues are you and your group tackling in the community? Do you mostly focus on LGBT community or are there other things? Like in our communities, often projects focus on prisoner support or anti-fascist work. When it's a community, I'm talking about this community over here. It's like, you know, this block or the blocks surrounding this space. We are thinking in a very small space. For example, we are just, we just want to develop the idea that you can do stuff by yourself. That you don't need to ask permission to do anything. It's like, uh, um, we don't want them to think in any direction, you know? We don't want to extend any ideology for them to be part of, no. We just want to create spaces that they can decide when to meet, where to meet, what to do. So we have the uh, this knitting workshop here, you see knitting, we do this kind of stuff. So both, you know, ground, grown up women and people, you know, kids with 12, 13 years old come together here and we spend the time here every Saturday, every Friday afternoon and we talk and we knit, we, we're, we're knitting. So that's pretty much an example. They are, of course, exposed to everything here, but we don't invite them to read or to take anything or to do. They're just here. We just want them to feel free and eventually they will ask or they will do what they want in a way. But we also have been working on a corner uh, because garbage, you know, that all the trash over there, it's a huge issue for the community. And uh, we have transformed that corner because all that trash that you saw there on the street where where the garden is right now so we build the garden together with the neighbors so the trash is not inside the block anymore and that really creates an impact on people because they know that they cannot wait for the government to come and fix that corner we have to fix it by ourselves and so Eventually, we're going to do something with that. We're going to start recycling, we're going to start reusing. In fact, we've been using a lot of stuff from, the, from garbage and from trash. We take it here, uh, transform it into something else. But, and then neighbors started to do the same. And they, they are also taking, you know, some of the herbs that we have planted there and they use them. Uh, so it's a it, it's a, get them involved with some kind of direct transformation of their environment. We also have the um, it's like a movie. We project um, cartoons, but Cuban films or stuff. And the neighbors they didn't go to to the, to the movie theaters. Most of them they didn't have computers at their houses. At their houses they didn't have uh, tablets or laptops or anything like that. So they watch what the TV, what the Cuban television provides. That's all. So we provide something different here. And it's like, you know, it's super funny because it's, it's a huge screen at night. So it really dramatically changed the, the logic of the, of, the, of the neighborhood. Suddenly that light, what's that? And with the sound, it's very loud. With the, and you see like, and we try to find Cuban films who are very connected with this. We also have that kind of projection in here, but with other contents. Like we have an, an LGTV night with LGTV films. Now we're planning to make another night in the month for anarchist films. We will also have another night for environmentalist uh, documentaries or films. So, but the space out there, we don't want to go with very political contents because that will not attract people. So here come with people who are interested in the topic with the uh, members of the LGTV community, students from the Havana University, researchers, environmentalists, whatever. They come directly to see that film and talk about it. And we also have developed some 
dialogues or chats with topics who are related with the with something that the, that the community feels like necessary for example is the uh, the religion the Afro-Cuban religion so we promoted the dialogue between Babalaos or Afro-Cuban priests and and uh, environmentalists uh, animal defenders because you know these priests they make sacrifices of animals so we create the space for both sides to talk about it about the issue of sacrificing animals and you know placing the remains in the street in the corner and that idea of such conversation was because the neighbor that works with us in the garden he is an African priest so we talk about it and we talk about the issue of sacrificing animals how much we like animals and and uh, then we say okay let's make a serious conversation about let's bring specialists of both sides to talk about it and it was super relevant for the first time in Cuba that you know environmentalists and priests were talking about animal protection <clears throat> and then we discover that there were some priests that they may know animal sacrifices they use the same they do the same ceremonies with no animals so which was like something new even for some of the priests that were here they were not accepting that practice but but everything was okay so so that's what we want to do We're trying to identify topics that could be have could have some connection with the community and make conversations could sometimes could be here could be out, out there this is the final straw radio and you're hearing a chat with isbel diaz torres an anarchist lgbt and ecological activist and participant in a social center in havana cuba recorded in 2018 by a comrade is there ever a tension you know you're working with the community out here but i'm obviously a gringo dressed weird is there ever a tension between it being a space that brings people who look like they're not from here and being able to organize with the neighborhood? Not that I know. I guess they would talk about it, but they don't tell us anything or, or anything has nothing has changed. We have very good relations with everybody and in fact I guess the people feel like important when they get visitors from other countries here. Hey, I didn't know that we were making something such important. For example, the garden. Everybody goes and see the garden. And everybody sees that I'm bringing some comrades to see the garden. And so they would say, okay, it's important to have a garden because, you know, people are, in, you know, foreigners are interested in that. Uh, so, yeah, that can help. Also, it's, for other other communitarian projects with different perspective, sometimes it has really affected the whole point because they become a place where to develop something to show to tourists. And we have something like that five blocks from here. It was supposed to be like a communitarian project with art that they... Oh, is that the building on the corner with all the art? I was going to ask what that was. That was, that's a perfect example and you know the community is not there they don't go to visit and use the space in a way they just receive foreigners right and that's the way of living you know. so that's uh, the danger but I'm sure it's not go- that's not going to happen here because we are very aware of that and, and in fact yeah, we do have a political perspective of our own that's not the same with those other parties. They are looking away for survival or something. Is there ever a dynamic where if you're doing lots of communitarian projects like gardens or film nights and someone from the government or the party comes around and says, hey, you're doing a lot of great things for the community. You should consider joining, becoming the head of your local comité in defensa. That's the lot. That's been happening all the time for all these interesting projects and they when they see some, they see someone who is really active in their community they try to how you said copt and make him part of the system in a way but 
they won't try that with us. They won't even try. But yeah, that's the logic. It's been happening here forever. In any kind of thing that you could imagine, hip hop, rock, whatever, you'll see that. I went to La Madriguera and thought, I can tell from where it's placed that the government said, hey, let's make a rock club in the middle of this park, far away from houses, over here where you're not bothering anybody. <laughs> exactly. Yes, they really know how to do it. And they created the Cuban agency of rock, and then they created the Cuban agency of, of hip hop, of rap, and it killed the whole movement. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. For, at, at first, there were some divisions of some of the bands wanted to be part of the agency, and some others, no, they want to keep their, their autonomy. But eventually, these ones disappeared, and the only re that remained were the, the ones uh, uh, connected with the agency. And then all the political contents, all the, the real stuff was missing up the lyrics, and it was not there anymore. Yeah. <laughs> they have a magazine, you know. Having a magazine here in Cuba is, you know, it has to be approved by the party. So if you have a hip hop magazine approved by the Communist Party, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. you really don't know what's that. <laughs> that power of cop is, uh, is always present. For anyone who comes to Cuba or anyone who hears this interview, what can they do to support ABRA and other anarchist initiatives in Cuba? The first thing is, I recommend people when they want to approach to the Cuban situation, try to look at personal or collectives that you, they can identify. Because there is this idea of what Cuba is, it's like an abstract idea of, you know, a focus of rebel, of, a, I don't know, an alternative for the world or something like that, and it is not. But you do can find here people who really is fighting and struggling against uh, capitalism, against yeah, against Cuban capitalism and international capitalism everywhere. So if they want to send their support, try to to identify to who they want to to be related with. In a way, that's the first thing. On the other hand, for us, the best help that we have ever received is to be completely public. Since we are not that kind of group of anarchists that we are not like um, insurrectionists. Yeah. Since we, we, we don't have that power, we don't have that kind of amount of people, we don't intend to be violent in any way, we can be completely public because we want like a communitarian transformation and to work from to some kind of grassroots work in a way. And that, that's been our protection. We never hide from the, from the government. Just tell them exact, exactly what you think. And international comrades, international organizations, people help when they also promote the idea of our web or any public statement that we publish or any call that we make for the for any international event or something like that that's a very good help for us because it's uh, it helps us to build that shield which is transparency in being public are there vegans in cuba oh that's super interesting i just i'm just having a fights right now about it in, in, the, uh, in Facebook. <laughs> uh, yes, there are. It's a few of them. It's very difficult. In my opinion, in Cuba, that's an option only for wealthy people and not for a company. I mean, we eat whatever we can find. There's no option. There are no, there are no vegetables or... Everything is difficult. Both vegetables, meat, eggs, milk. If you find any of that, and you have the money, you get it, if you don't. So that, I understand that you, I mean, that, that need of being responsible or coherent with that topic, it's important and for us, that we are also environmentalists, it's quite important. So we really promote that idea. And for example, in every event that we develop here, 
any gathering, any meeting, there are also always vegan options. So we don't think that they don't exist. All the contrary, we say there are people who are, who are vegan or are vegetarian or whatever. They need to have an option here. And if, in fact, we are also developing this um, permaculture. Do you know what permaculture is? Well, we have we just started a permaculture permaculture uh, workshop, so we are learning about it. And most of the people who are related with that workshop are vegan. They are friends or comrades who are. But uh, at the same time, it's not that you can really demand from people to have that kind of position because mm -hmm. people really have no, they don't have the means to do that. To, to have a balanced diet only using that kind of food. In fact, we have here a little something that we published. So we've been thinking about it. This is not a subject that we just uh, we ignore or, or anything like that. But it's something you, you need to promote very carefully here. And not demanding, but, but saying how beautiful it is to, <laughs> in a way, right? And here's a content warning for the following question. There is discussion of animal abuse. Uh, if you don't want to hear it, I would I would skip ahead a couple of minutes. On that subject, I was curious. It's not the same as animal sacrifice, but I wondered if anyone does anything about birds in cages. There are a lot of birds in cages here, and I find it really upsetting. In general, all this, the, the well, there is a whole movement of animal protectors in, in Cuba right now. This is like something new. Something from the last three years, something like that, and there's a lot of small groups all around the country, and they're pretty much focused on cats and dogs, mm -hmm. but also horses, mm -hmm. and eventually birds, but that's not very common. There is no protection for the animals here in Cuba. There's no. The, those groups are demanding for a law that protects animals' life, but we didn't have it yet. In fact, we recently discovered this guy who was in contact with an international network of people who <clears throat> torture animals mm. and rapes animals. Oh, yeah. And they video record them and upload them to the, to the cloud. And there was a Cuban doing that. And people from the U.S. identified the person and sent the information to the given protectors. They identified the guy, they complained, and the policemen were there, arrest the guy, and three days later he was free. And uh, about one or two months ago, this activist went to, the, to his neighborhood, and he made a public campaign on the, on, the, on the park, very close to his house, and then they went to the, his house, but he was not there. Um, but they went to the river and they found a lot of corp, corpse of dogs and cats that were there in the river, pretty, probably killed by this man. And the guy is completely free. There is no, he was not violating any law. When they went to his house, did they do it as a demonstration to expose him? They really didn't know what to do. It's, it's not something that, you know, for Cubans, we didn't have any real social movements. We don't have the practice of that. So they, they were very angry and they decided to go to make this campaign for the, uh, for the protection of animals in the park. And then a couple of them decided, all right, why don't we go to the house of the guy? Huh. And they go, they, they didn't know what to do. They just go, <laughs> you see? And uh, another part of the group was say, okay, no, no, then go, he could be dangerous, uh, whatever. And nothing happened. The guy was not there. Was not there. But but it's a good thing in a way that for the first time this kind of topics for the LGTV movements and the, the the animal protection movements is emerging in a way you know and they are they are taking positions disregarding what the government thinks about it right so that's important. It sounds like practicing some form of direct action going to his house. Exactly. Exactly. But there's no organization yet. They don't know what to do, they, are, they don't plan anything, but it's, it's a good thing. <laughs> when you said it's not common in Cuba for demonstrations to happen, 
I don't know if it's in modern Cuba or in Cuba past, but I've heard that it's often a practice of the Comités de Defensa de la Revolución, that they would organize stage protests of just CDR members to make their pres- their repression look like a community action. So they do. But of course they did do it spontaneously. I received an order from the political police to they prepare everything. In fact, we are very close from one of those dissident groups, is the Damazo Blanco. I don't know if you've heard about them. Ladies in white. And four blocks away from here, they have they live with a, a police car in front of their house the whole time. And eventually, they, they organized demonstrations in front of his house and tiran cosas contra las paredes. Um. Yeah, throwing things against the wall. But are these uh, Damas and Blanco, are they super patriotic? My misunderstanding? Damas and Blancos is a dissident group. They're the wives or mothers or daughters of a group of dissidents that were put in prison. 75 of them. Just They were just journalists. They were writing but they were put in prison and they, they have very long uh, sentences. So they start demos- demonstrating at street, you know, dressing in white with a flower in the hand and just walking in line in silence. That's all. They were repressed all the time. And, and now, well, something, well, those people were released in a way. They were sent to Spain, some of them, some of them not. <clears throat> but they, but then the movement, re, the movement remain active. Uh, they do have connections with the U.S. government, and in that, that's the, the excuse of the, of the of the Cuban government to repress them. Although what they're doing is just to manifest in a peaceful way. But they do have a, a, a support from the, from the U.S. government. It sounds very parallel to the Argentinian Madres de la Plaza de Mayo. Yeah. Although the Cuban government has never recognized that that was not fair for them to be in prison. So if, you, if, if there is a similar, similarity with the La Abuela de Plaza de Mayo, we are in a very early stage <laughs> yet. Yeah, the government changed there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but we're right here now. Thank you. And I'm sorry, you just needed to listen to my opinion about it. Ask people on the street, they will tell you a different story. And uh, you have a whole, a more complete picture of, of the king of reality. Yeah. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Bursa Goodness. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816.